Welcome to Leading the Next Generation with Tim Elmore, where our mission is to empower the emerging generations with skills to lead in real life. Hey listeners, Andrew here. Uh, with me as always is Dr. Tim Elmore. How are you today, Tim? I'm very well. You uh, doing okay? I'm doing great. Good. Excited about our conversation yeah, today. Yeah, me too. I am So too. we're on episode two. Uh, mm-hmm. We're doing three episodes here talking about this new resource that you've got coming out, a book called A New Kind of Diversity, which is a fantastic resource. And so we're kind of digging into different elements of what we've, mm-hmm. uh, what that book is really all about. So I'm excited about that. But uh, today we're starting with a story. Um, it's one of the, I think, probably most maybe intense things that's ever happened to you, but it's such a great example of sort of the power of understanding when you've got somebody's attention, I think. So let's dive in. Yeah, it's true. I I think as we talk about different generations, um, the big idea, listeners, today is if you can seize your moment, meaning I'm I'm a part of this generation, this is the value I have to add, uh, you take advantage of an opportunity. So I had an opportunity that started with a frightening moment and turned into a, an amazing opportunity. Um, I don't talk much about this these days, but I was in a plane crash when I was 30 years old. Yeah. So it was a small plane, but not a small crash. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were four of us in this uh, Piper plane, private plane, that was landing on a grassy field. And um, I noticed as I looked over the pilot's shoulder, there was no runway down there. Yeah. So that this was, was a, where? What country? This was in New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. So I was there for a couple of weeks talking to students. And um, I even mentioned, I said, Grant, I don't see a runway down there. He goes, it's no big deal. I've done this four times. That's what he said, four times. I thought, well, wonderful. I would have loved to hear a little bit more yeah, than yeah. four times. I, I said, that's yeah. four more times than me. Yeah. Well, he, he's not able to land. He, brings, he starts to bring the plane down, and he realizes he can't touch down and have enough runway to stop the plane before the yeah. forest. There's yeah. a set of trees, a wooded important. area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he tries to take the plane back up. Long story short. He just shoots almost straight up. We're uh, tightening our seat belts as we go up, and the engine stalls. Oh my and he's goodness. not instrument rated, so the buzzers are buzzing, the lights are flashing, and and the pilot screams. <laughs> That's how you know you're in trouble. That's my favorite and least favorite part of the yeah, whole story. Oh, at all the yeah, ones. yeah, I'm my, sure that was a similar memory for you. So we start to spiral, and it is quite a miracle. I don't mean to be superficial or silly here, but it was a miracle that we survived because everyone did. Correct. Grant went through the windshield, but he and he was thrown, but he lived. Wow. And we were the rest of the three of us were thrown around the plane, but we all lived. So they pull our bodies from the plane. The helicopter shows up from the hospital, the, their own version of life flight, you yeah. know, and they have room for three, not four. So guess who got left behind? <laughs> the See, one who was least injured, right? That, that's true. And that was me. Yeah. So I'm, the good news is I was least injured. Bad news, that means I'm not going to get treated for quite yeah. a while. But here's the opportunity. Uh, as I'm there on the field and they're patching up my ankle and my rib and my head, I'm thinking this is crazy that we made it through this. You yeah. Know? I mean, I knew enough. I was conscious. By the way, there's a part of me that wished I would have blacked out and just remembered later, oh, yeah. wow, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I remember everything. This is the television generator. I remember watching everything, the yeah. wing, the hit. So I, I just wondered what's going to come of this and what's going to come of me. Well, they took me over to the house, and as it turns out, I spoke that night <laughs> to the – to the students. I mean, they, they came back and said, do you want to just sit there? I said, you know what? I think I can I'm still- I'm pretty good. Actually. I can still talk. And they go, oh yeah, we can tell. Well, that's like the most Tim Elmore story ever. Yeah, well, yeah. I yeah. got in a plane crash, but I still spoke that yeah, night. That, you know? Yeah. Well, here's what I learned. You never have the attention of an audience so acutely. Yes. That's when you come off a plane crash and say, let me, let me tell you what I, what I, what I know. Yes. You know. They're all taking notes. Well, they, so. they probably didn't need a long introduction. Nobody needed to stand up and say, here's Tim's accomplishments. And go, this is Tim Elmore. He was in a plane crash today. I'm going to let him speak now. <laughs> well, I did say something, what I think is funny. You know, I always think I'm funny. Uh-huh. The first thing I said to the students was, I said, you know, there was new, no movie on the flight, but every now and then your life flashed before your eyes. You know, <laughs> boom, boom. So anyway, yeah, they uh, thought, I can't believe you're joking tonight. So I'm guessing you had a very captive audience that evening. I did. Is I did. And, and, the, and the point, of course, is this. Sometimes there are moments when you realize you have an advantage. You have yeah. a, an opportunity yeah. that may not come again. And um, you just need to seize it uh, as long as you, you have it. So I think this is true about generations. When I think about the jet four generations on our team yeah. and the listeners that are listening, I bet you could think, yeah, we got three or four where we are, maybe five, yeah. where we work in our school or our sports team or our company. Um, I think 
we need to remember, we need to take advantage of those um, different generations, but ageism is alive and well. Ageism is not dead. Yeah. It is very much alive yes, and well. Yes, that is the truth. So in case ageism is a term that you're all not quite sure you remember what it means, ageism refers to the stereotypes, how we think, the prejudice, how we feel, mm -hmm. and then the discrimination, how we act toward others or oneself based on our age. Yeah. I hear I hear people beat themselves up because they do feel like they're a narcissistic millennial. Yeah. And I go, no, 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 yeah. no. I know that I know we're we've been throwing you throwing shade on you for forever, but that's not you. Yeah. You know. Um, so and then there's chronocentricism. This is another term mm -hmm. from social psychology. So Jib Foles um, talks about members of any generation carry with them a set of norms about what is right. Uh, just like we do about our own culture. Yeah. We drive on the right side of the right side of the road. That's right. Well, no, it's not right. It's yeah. right in America, but not in England. Yep. So we tend to think, well, I'll just admit, I was born in 1959, so I tend to see things a certain way, not bad or good, just based on when I grew up and mm -hmm. the, the protest and the assassinations I watched and the scary times of the 60s and 70s. I thought the world was going to end in 1968. Yeah. Detroit was on fire. Yeah. You know, we burned our bras, we burned our buildings, <laughs> we burned our, uh, you know, draft cards yeah. for Vietnam. Not me personally. Yeah. Of but, but others. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Chronocentricism and ageism are two huge factors, and that unless we're careful, it's going to happen to us. Yeah, and all of us, I mean, if we could, if you would even, as you're listening to this podcast, take a minute and just think back in your own life, you could think of, you could realize there are there are perspectives and opinions I have that are just based on the time that I grew up in, and maybe some things that have gone unchallenged, right? Yeah. I just assume that's the way the world should be without yes. ever thinking about it. And in reality, that comes from more my age and the time yeah. I grew up up in than reality. Here's a classic illustration of what you're talking about. All down through history, at least dating way back to Socrates, this attitude that we always hear, kids today. Exactly. Kids today. Yeah. Socrates basically said that. He yeah. said kids are disrespectful. He said they're partying in the streets. That sounds like today to me. <laughs> it does. But that was Socrates. Plato said the same thing. Yes. T.S. Eliot in the 20th century. Yeah. God, dude, we were at a worse time than we've ever been. Yeah. I think those were civic-minded children that fought in World War II yes. when he says this. Yeah. So it's, isn't that funny? And yeah. today we're, we swear kids are never going to be ready. Yep. So... So I would just say we need to be careful. Mm -hmm. At one time, I was kids today. Yep. When the baby boomers were growing up, the builder generation who raised us said, these boomers are never good. They're, they're protesting. They're never. Well, guess what? Now we're the ones mad at our kids for protesting yeah. because we joined the very establishment we had protested against. I know. So anyway, it's just a funny thing. The world comes full circle, doesn't yeah, it? Yes, it does. Yeah. So we now have a chance to receive and gain from so many generations, more so than at any time in modern history. Which is wild. I tried to say a hyperbolic statement. Did you, did that send goosebumps? You should say it again. Okay. All right. So we now have a chance to receive. Thank you. Thank you so Don't much. Don't you love it when somebody up. asks you to do that? It's like you're the straight guy. I'm the funny guy. I know. I'll, yeah. I'll pay you later. Yeah. So we now have the chance to gain from different generations more than any other time in, in, in modern history. Ask me why. Why? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, me too. There are seven. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. People continue to listen to this podcast. There are seven generations that are alive right now. And I love interacting with all of them. Yeah. So, so let me just give you some examples from my life. Let's do I it. know someone from seven generations. So my aunt and uncle are from the senior generation. My uncle Gene is 99 years old. Wild. He will turn 100 in December. Yeah. And he's still driving his motorhome. <laughs> yeah, a motorhome. Yes. yes. Not a little Toyota. Yeah. He's driving a motorhome. That's right. On I-8 in San Diego. Okay. Well, and if you're on I-8 right now, right. just... <laughs> Look Leave. around you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and, and avoid the large yeah, Winnebago. Yep, yep. So Uncle Gene and Aunt Wanda from the senior generation, they were born between 1902 and 1928. Yeah, okay. Uncle Gene was born in 1922. Aunt Wanda was born, in, I think, in 1924 or 25. So my mother and father-in-law are from the builder generation, 1929 and 1945. Mm -hmm. So they grew up during the Great Depression and World War II as children. Yeah. They are, in my mind, just fabulous people. Wow. Um, and then my wife and I are both from the baby boomer generation, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, 1946 to 64, we were called the boomers because there was a boom of babies post-World War II. Mm -hmm. The maternity wards filled up. My teammates, Sean and Nicole, are both from Generation X. Yeah. We have more and more Xers joining our staff. Yeah. 
1965 to 82, Gen X was first called baby busters because their generation started with the public introduction of the contraceptive or the birth control pill. Yep. So it was a bust, not a boom. Uh, my children are both from the millennial generation, two of the best millennials. They're and, incredible. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and I'm so modest about them. You are. Um, 1983 to 2000. Then our summer interns, Hannah and Charlie, and uh, James, all from Gen Z, yeah. okay, 2001 to 2016. And then my little buddies, Wilson and Weston, are both from Generation Alpha. I love Wilson and Weston. Yes, Good I do kids. too. They are great kiddos. And JT was just telling me what he's learning from Weston. I love it. Who, uh, yeah. And Wilson is already uh, saying when, it, when his brother's in his room, he said, I need my alone time. <laughs> I heard he's about four. He's four. I need my alone time for my brother. <laughs> me too, buddy. Me nah. too. <laughs> That's right. What, that's what Tyler says. Anyway, isn't that amazing? Seven generations. Yeah. And they're all going to have a slightly different paradigm with yeah. which they look at the world because, I mean, think about the Gen Alphas. We did a podcast on this, but their the last few years, pandemic, the Trump administration and others, they're looking up at grownups going, is this normal? Yeah. All of you is acting this like this? To be? Yeah. Masks and fighting? Is yeah. that what you do as adults? I often think, if we're not seeing our kids turning into healthy adults, is it because we didn't show them a healthy adult yet? Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, each of these individuals possess a slightly different perspective on the world, and I think it's because we were shaped by different events. In fact, here's something that might be helpful for listeners. Um, Dr. Britt Andreata is yes. a neuroscientist. She Brilliant. was very helpful. We had her speak at one of our national leadership forums. Yeah. She wrote a book called Wired to Resist. And she talks about how the fact that our neural pathways in our brain mm -hmm. are forming the first 20, 25 years, but they become set almost like concrete. And it's not that we can't change after 25, but change becomes measurably harder yes. after. And I'll, I'll vouch for that. You know, I've yeah. oh, got my way here. You yeah. know, I eat, I eat two pieces of toast in the morning. I drink <laughs> coffee. You know, I'm yep. a creature of habit. Yeah. But the point is, in her book, Wired to Resist, she talks about how we got to be careful because we can get set in ways that we shouldn't be set yeah. when we need to adapt. And right now, my generation is learning that. I know older principals and assistant principals and teachers that just can't understand the 23-year-old teacher colleague. Yeah. And and she's going to be different or he's going to be different. So. Yeah. And we often don't recognize that maybe in until it's too late. We, uh, we often throw shade at generations because we think that the perspective or the attitude that we don't like about them came from, well, it's because of the time they grew up in, yeah. but there are, there's some brain science there as well as to what's going on and why it, why it's shaping them. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. So, um, I recently began to be a little despondent about this, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the research and thinking, I think I'm still relevant, but I got to admit, Andrew, I know you might laugh at this, but I, am I, do I just need to turn it over to Andrew and Cam and the gang and you know, cheer them on. And maybe, maybe I do. That's another podcast for another time. But I'm just thinking, uh, gosh, if I'm not on the cusp of innovation, yeah. if I'm not on the cusp of ideation or, you know, whatever, creating something brand new, um, you know, am I washed up? I know that sounds crazy, but I just, I had a melancholy day or two mm. recently until I began to read some research. And we'll talk more about that later, but it just was very heartening to know, no, I don't need to try to be me when I was 25. I need to be me today yes. and be the best version of who I am now. And that is the trick, isn't it? Yeah. I love that. Well, so we're going to dig into that in just a minute, but I actually want to take a quick break before we do that. So when we come back, Tim's going to walk us through what each generation actually does bring to the table. So when you think about what age you are, what might you be able to bring, what value might you be able to bring to those conversations? So we'll get there when we come right back. Hey, podcast listeners, Andrew here. I'd like to tell you about a brand new book from our very own Dr. Tim Elmore that you can pre-order right now. This book is called A New Kind of Diversity, Making the Different Generations on Your Team a Competitive Advantage. If you've been around growing leaders for very long, you know that we talk a lot about generations. Starting way back in 2010, Tim wrote his very first book on generations called Generation IY. And even back then, we began to see the importance of understanding how birth years can affect the way we think and interact with one another. But Tim, I want you to tell us about it because this new book discusses the topic of generations from a little bit of a different direction. So tell us a little bit more about this book. Yeah, so I've been intrigued by generations for my entire career, dating back to the late ni the 1980s when the boomers and Xers were new kids on the block. But in 2001, I did a book called Nurturing the Leader Within Your Child, where I put the very first generation chart uh, in that book. And ever since that time, I've just been intrigued 
What if we could get beyond just studying the younger generation, learn about all the generations? So if we're not careful, we can merely get frustrated with older or younger generations around us. I think that's happened probably to all of us. Um, our kids, our colleagues, our athletes, our coaches, they're all either old school or new wave. In this book, I identify the items that shaped the builder generation, the baby boomers, the Xers, the millennials, and Gen Zers, and what they offer to the rest of us, along with what they need. The entire book is about how to leverage each generation to be a competitive advantage rather than a disadvantage because we're colliding, not collaborating. I'm so excited to get this book into the hands of, of people. I'm so excited about it too. I'm personally really excited to get my hands on this book. It's going to be a fantastic resource and it's really gonna work for literally anyone who works alongside colleagues from a different generation. Whether they're older than you or younger than you, you're gonna learn more about who they are, how they grew up and how to interact with them well. So what I wanna challenge you to do is click the link in the description in order to pre-order a new kind of diversity right now. You can also go to the website, newdiversitybook.com um, in order to pre-order it there. The book is going to be released on October 25th, but I wanna ask you to do us a favor. In fact, it's a favor for our dear friend, Dr. Tim Elmore. Don't wait for the release of the book in order to buy it. Go ahead and pre-order it right now. What this does is it actually makes the book a little bit more of a success for Tim. It's gonna get into more people's hands and more people are gonna hear about it around the country and around the world. So be sure to click that link in the description and pre-order Tim's new book, A New Kind of Diversity, today. Thanks. All right, Tim, we're back. Now, uh, we, you're going to take us towards kind of seeing what each generation might be able to bring to the table. So let's dive into that a little bit. Well, I recently read some good news for my old brain. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious about this. So um, back in 1971, uh, a British psychologist by the name of Raymond Cattell uh, published a book on his research. Uh, the book was called Abilities, Their Structure, Growth, and Action. So we had really catchy titles back in the 70s. Say, yeah. But the research is well worth reading, so don't judge a book by its title. Yeah. Um, he basically talked about how our brains change over time, and he posited that there are two kinds of intelligence. Let me say that again, listeners. There's two kinds of intelligence that we enjoy based on the life station we're in. Interesting. And all people possess both at all times, but you're going to be stronger in one than the other. And what you need to do is capitalize on the brain you've got right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I like that. Yep. So the first kind is what he called fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence. So we experience this most in our early years, maybe at the first 30 to 40 years. Okay. Our brains are young and they're best at thinking flexibly, flexibly uh, at reasoning, at solving novel problems. Yeah. Why? Because they're new. You know, it's just, yeah. I don't even have a, I'm not constricted by old paradigms. I have no old yeah, paradigms. I'm already in that water. That's right. I'm yeah. just swimming in it. Yeah. That's right. These abilities are strongest in our early adult years, as I mentioned, and begin to diminish in our 30s and 40s and, okay. and beyond. The second kind is crystallized intelligence. So fluid and crystallized. Okay. We experience this most in our second 40 years, uh, and this is defined as the ability to use a stock of knowledge learned from the past. So we learn after four decades, I best know how to use this. So I get it the first 40 years, I know how to use it my second 40 yeah, Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. And of course that makes sense. It does. In fact, to me, that explains why I continue to read that some of the highest marks that are given to college professors are for the older professors. Yeah. Well, they may not be coming up with a new idea, but they're really good at clarifying that old idea. Yeah. Or or that old, you know, the research they picked up. So um, it's just fascinating to me that maybe I can really take advantage of the best version of me and listeners, you can too, figure out where you are in life and say, I'm, I don't need to be me in the past. Yeah. I don't need to be me in the future. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about writing a book if you're 20. Yeah. Wait a little bit. Yeah. You'll you know, get there. You'll clarify. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, I'm, I'm suggesting that this crystallized knowledge is the capacity to collate information, mm -hmm. summarize it, and express it to others. And we do this best past midlife. Now, here's what's intriguing to me. As I look at parents today, parents were much, 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 much younger before 
The good news about that, when they had children, yeah. the good news for that, they had the energy. Yes. So I yeah. see people having kids at 40 and they go, I don't know if I have the energy. Yeah, but you're so good at knowing what's important by that. Yeah. And really crystallizing the idea for your child that's seven or five yep. years you're old. You're going to answer those questions better and yeah. you're coming to the table with the va- uh, values and understanding that better and all those things. Yeah. yeah. So maybe this would be helpful for listeners. Listeners, uh, if you're driving, do not write this down. But... Um, <laughs> I want to give you two columns. So imagine in your in your brain two columns, a left hand and a right hand column. The left hand column will be attributes of fluid intelligence, and the right hand side will be attributes of of crystallized intelligence. So we'll kind of compare these two. I'm going to try to crystallize it for you, since you know I'm 62 years old. Ask. Okay, <laughs> that is so, your job, right? That's now. right. And then yeah. you come up with a new idea by the time uh, we're done. I'll do my best. Okay. Number one, under fluid intelligence, as I mentioned, strongest during our first 40 years. Yeah. Number one, under crystallized. Strongest during our second 40 years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number two under fluid intelligence, adaptation and innovation. Okay. So you're just naturally going to want to innovate. Yeah. In fact, I have to remember that when our young teamers come up with new ideas and I go, what's wrong with the one I came up with in 2003? Yeah. Well, it's because it's in 2003, Mr. Yeah, Elmo. Yeah. You know? uh, number two, crystallize clarification and summarization. Mm. So when you think of me, isn't that what you Getting think? Getting to the heart of the Tim, matter. Tim yes. summarized that. Yes, he did. Yes. Only took him 45 minutes. <laughs> All right. It's fluent intelligence, number three, I can see what's coming. Yeah. Crystallized intelligence, I can share what we learned. That's mm. my favorite one of this list I put together. I can see what's coming. I can share what we learned. Yeah. I, see, I think that's you and me, yes. you know? Yep. Okay. Uh, number four, fluid intelligence, I tend to learn things quickly. Mm-hmm. Number four, under crystallized, I tend to teach things quickly. Yes. Bless the, my kids grew up. Oh my gosh. Everything was a leadership lesson. There was a professor. What, whatever with movie. Them at all times. Oh my gosh. Yep. Yes. They said, Dad, The Wizard of Oz is not a leadership movie. <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite is not a leadership movie. <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite may not be a leadership. I don't know. You <laughs> I, could probably do I it. I found some nuggets. I'm sure okay. you did. <laughs> or should I say, uh, were they tots? Yeah, not tots. Nuggets. You found okay. some tots. Uh, and then under fluid intelligence, number five, I'm a creator, I invent. Uh, number five, under crystallized intelligence, I'm a coach. I synthesize. I love it. I got tears in my eyes as I read this research because I thought, how many educators do I know or parents I know yeah. that go, dang it, I'm over the hill. I'm just going to quit. So I need to tell a quick story. Um, a few days ago, I was with um, some wonderful principals in a school district here in Metro Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And there were APs and principals that were there. And one of the principals afterwards said, with tears in his eyes, I was thinking about retiring after this year. I'm 60 and I just, I just don't think I have it in me anymore. And, mm. you know, kids today, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But as I, he said, Tim, as I heard you talk about the alphas and the Gen Zers that could be the next greatest generation. They went through a pandemic. They went through a pandemic. Yeah. They went through a depression. They went through an economic turmoil. They, you know, oh my gosh, there's so many parallels to 100 years ago. And he thought, I'm going to stay in there and I'm going to keep going. So I love it. I love it. So what I think he was saying is crystallized intelligence. I can take advantage of this. Maybe I am who they need. Mm-hmm. I won't tell them how to dress. <laughs> I won't tell them what color their hair should be yeah. or what piercing to not get or whatever. I'll tell them what I know. Yeah. The timeless stuff. Yeah. I picked up. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And, it, you know, the important thing to remember is it's not not uh, just because I'm 55 years old does not mean I can't come up with a creative idea. Yeah, of course. It's just more about taking advantage of the time you're in. And that's where the, the perspective shift that we're looking for is what if I saw the moment I was in in its all of its advantages mm-hmm. rather yeah. than its disadvantages? That's exactly you know? it. And I, what's funny is we're talking probably about uh, adults who look at young people and think, well, I don't have that, you know, but I grew up a lot of times thinking, I wish I could get to be older so people would pay more attention to me or listen to me or whatever it was. Yeah. And it was that same thing. Instead of capitalizing yeah. on yeah. the brain that I had, I was, you know, t- not taking advantage. So it actually works in both directions. It really does. And it's, I think it's so good thinking about what value I have to bring right now and just sort of accepting that and trying to get the most yes. out of that. So one of my heroes is Arthur Brooks. You've heard me talk about him yeah. probably ad nauseum. But um, he's a Harvard Business School prof, uh, social scientist, PhD. Uh, I love what he said. When you're young, you have raw smarts. Mm -hmm. When you're old, you have wisdom. When you're young, you can generate lots of facts. When you're old, you know what they mean and how to use them. I think he's right. So real quick case study before we start wrapping things up here. Um, Charles Darwin, 
and Johann Sebastian Bach. I know those guys. Yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Names I've heard before. You listened in school. That's yes. really good. So let me just real quick summarize these two lives because they are pictures of not taking advantage of the plane crash yeah. <laughs> and taking advantage of the plane crash. Oh, I see. So Charles Darwin would clearly be in anybody's mind a li uh, top ten top ten list anyway of scientists that have ever lived. Yeah, he's very famous for you know theory of evolution, etc. Charles Darwin is considered a brilliant scientist, but did you know he made his initial discoveries in his twenties? That's wild. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, um, when he was thirteen years old, he set up a science lab in his garden shed. That probably sounds like a scientist like Darwin. It does. And when he was sixteen years old, Darwin was sent to Edinburgh. Uh, to train to become a doctor as his father and grandfather had been. So you're naturally going to be a doctor. Well, at 22, he transitioned to biology and took a voyage aboard the HMS Beagle to study species around the world. And that's when the epiphanies happened to him. Whether you like him or not, these epiphanies began to happen at 22, 23, yeah. 24 years old. But get this, he died years later, uh, a very disappointed man. Hmm. I wouldn't have guessed that. I've not read his biography, but as I've read people who've written about his story, yeah. they say he was very despondent at the end. Um, he grew despondent about not staying on top of his field. And the problem was he expected himself to continue in fluid intelligence instead of learning to capitalize on his crystallized intelligence. Yeah, so he's watching other people make discoveries, yes. younger scientists and going, oh, that should have been me or whatever yeah. it is. And hearing people even prove later some of his theories were absolutely wrong. That's yeah. what they're saying today. Yeah. Some of his theories are absolutely wrong. Yeah. But you know what? You're building, you're standing on my shoulders. Yeah. Celebrate that. But if you still try to be who you were, life's not going to be good for you. Yeah. You're going to be, mel you're going to have a midlife crisis. Part Listen to me, at listeners. <laughs> yeah. Midlife crisis, get a Ferrari, change wives, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. I'm saying... That's not your answer. Yeah. It's an internal change, not an external change you probably need to make. So um, he dies a very disappointed man and because he wasn't able to capitalize on who he had become. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. Opposite story. Johann Sebastian Bach, even if you're not a music lover, you've heard of you Bach. You know that name, yes. Yeah. He may have managed his career a little bit better, and I say that because of this. He wrote groundbreaking music in his 20s and 30s. In fact, some of his best music came back came from then. He grew famous for composing every major Baroque genre, including concertos, sonatas, cantatas, numerous organ pieces, very famous for, for, for his organ work. Along the way, now get ready. <laughs> well, he, I can see it. It's yes, wild. Yeah, yeah. He fathers 20 children. <laughs> so it wasn't just making music. 20. That's right. That's 20 wild. 20 children. One of his sons, Carl Philip Emanuel, actually introduced the world to classical music. He noticed my son is better than I am. Wild. Instead of becoming despondent at, dang, I thought I was awesome. He's thinking, my son may pass me up. He's going to stand on my shoulders. And so he assumed that role. Uh, Bach's son was considered the most talented in the family. And instead of brooding over this, Bach celebrated his son's success and became his best teacher. Mm. Bach could have become embittered like Darwin, but instead he took pride in his son passing, his, passing him up. He shifted into crystallized intelligence, whether he knew it or not. Yeah. And I love this, Andrew. In his later years, he taught and shared his talent with others. He literally died teaching. That's how I want to die. I want to be teaching and boom, there he goes. Who's going to finish this talk here? But um, I'm just thinking, what a powerful... Yeah. I know you think I'm crazy. Well, but. I just can't in the world imagine that happening, Tim, but... So I want to close by really crystallizing, if I may use that verb. Please do. Uh, how to repurpose your life. Many of you hearing this care deeply about the emerging generation. That's why you tune in. And if you're like me, you want to make a difference, but you may feel a distance between your mindset and that Gen Zer, uh, perhaps, that you're teaching, or Alpha Gen, or, or even Millennial. Uh, you may even feel a little like a dinosaur. Mm. I do sometimes. Uh, as I said earlier, I felt washed up for a while but I'm repurposing myself again. I have a new, kind of a new skip in my step. Um, so here's why. Number one, I have six big, big ideas. I'm allowing, my, I'm allowing the young to play to their strengths and welcome their new ideas. One of the things I'm most excited about is reading and proofing your book, you know, that's coming up. <laughs> I'm excited about that too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I just bring it on, baby. Yeah. Number two, I will um, even expect their innovation and ask them to help me adapt to it. I love it. So I expect you. I expect you and Cam and others. Bring it. Uh, number three, I'm pushing myself to play to my strengths of mentor and teacher. Mm. 
I intend to put wind in this new generation's sails as they innovate and create new ideas. I'll celebrate their successes, helping them stand on my shoulders and pass me up. And six, I won't try to be cool or hip. No one looks to me for those cues. That may shock you, but they don't. It might have been a while yeah. since anybody well, did. Well, okay, I've got to stop and tell this quick story. So Brian Porzio, one of my friends, was, was asking Siri questions. And just for fun, he said, Siri, is Tim Elmore cool? Siri immediately came back with a response. Tim Elmore gave up being cool in the year 2000. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, how did she know what that? in the world? We traced it back to I'd written an article uh -huh. how I said my kids do not need to be cool. They're not looking to me for cool cues. I'm their dad. I'm their parent, not their pal. Yep. And that was my big idea. Yep. Well, Siri picked it up. Yep. So I she gave up. She pulled that blog post. That's be careful right. what you post on the internet, folks. So I came to realize, back to seriousness now, that Johann Sebastian Bach's career had two parts. At first, he was a music innovator, and then he was a music instructor. Love it. And I think his best trait was resiliency, transitioning from creator to coach. And that's what I'm pushing everybody that's listening. Play to your brain strength. Take advantage of that plane crash and make the most of it. I love it. I love it. Tim, thank you so much for that. I feel like that's a, such a great challenge. Often when we talk about generations, we make the conversation of generations about somebody else. Yeah, yeah. But I think really understanding generations starts with me stopping and asking, who am I? Yeah. Where do I fit? What's my perspective? So I really yeah. love that. Love yep. that. Awesome. So I'd like to, if you don't mind, close do with it. a real quick story. I know we're running short on time, but um, listeners, there's a story that's 30 years old, but it remains one of my favorites. I've not told it in a year, years and years and years, but it was the Summer Olympics, 1992. You were four years old? I was, yeah. Four years old. Uh, I remember it distinctly because it was held in Barcelona, Spain, and one particular athlete in the... Um, I think it was the 400 meter race. So it was one time around the track. Uh, was a British athlete by the name of Derek Redman. Okay. And Derek lined up. And as he lines up at the starting blocks, the commentators, broadcasters, are sharing his story. He was called a miracle boy because Derek Redman had endured 22 surgeries oh my in preparation. Gosh. 22 on his Achilles tendon. So it was a miracle he was even in that race, much yeah. less competing as the best I was athlete. Let's say for, walking for, or yeah, at that's all, right, probably. Exactly. Yeah. So the gun is fired. He takes off, and he's in the middle of the pack with the fastest men in the world. Yeah. When halfway around the track, he grabs his, his hamstring, and he's injured himself a 23rd time. Wow. And he falls to the ground. And, of course, you hear the broadcaster say, Derek Redmond's out of the race. He's out of the race. And, of course, the cameras stay on the rest of the runners as they finish the race, and they announce gold and silver and bronze medal winners. I don't even remember who won gold and bronze and medal. I do remember Derek. Wow. Derek Redman is down on the track. The cameras race back to him, and he's trying to hoist himself back up because he said later, my country did not send me here to start this race. They mm. sent me to finish it. Mm. So he gets up, and he's hobbling toward the finish line. He's not going to place. I mean, it's several seconds. I mean, everybody's getting a shower now, you know? Yeah. And, and they're kind of golf clapping. Oh, that's so nice. And what a great young man, you know? Yeah. When in the upper deck of the grandstands, his mentor happens to be his dad, looks down and sees my son needs help. And I love the fact that Jim Redmond, who had been his mentor, by the way, he got him at 4 a.m., run, rode the bikes. Literally bought, with him the whole journey. Bought the yeah. Nikes and Reeboks and everything else. He pushes his way past the crowd, gets down to the gate, pushes his way past the two guards. No one can keep a good mentor down. Yeah. And he, and he I mean, he shoves his way. He is, he is determined. And when he gets to Derek, he puts his arm around him and he, it must have been a familiar touch because Derek just looks around and just falls into the chest mm. of his mentor. And these two men just hold each other for a minute. And then you see Jim whispering something to Derek. You can't hear anything because now the crowd's in an uproar. Cheering, yeah. Yeah. And Derek nods yes. So he must have said, you sure you want to finish this? And then Jim Redmond, according to the reports later, said this, Derek, we started this thing together. We're going to finish this thing together. Mm. And arm in arm. I can't even tell a story. <laughs> they finished the race. I love it. I thought to myself, even now, remember that story. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. 
So notice, Jim didn't run in that race. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't have done He wouldn't have qualified, no, yeah. But he sure could do what he did. Yeah. So that's how we need to transition. I love it. I love it. Well, Tim, thank you so much for leading us and challenging us to think about uh, what our place is. In fact, that's what this new resource that you've written is really all yeah. about, figuring out in the world of all of these different generations at play, what role do I play? What, how do I interact with these different folks? And so uh, I know many of you re uh, listening to this are uh, could probably really enjoy this resource. I just want to commend it to you one more time. The book is called A New Kind of Diversity, and it's all about taking advantage of the generations that are in your workplace, no matter what kind of workplace that is in a school, um, maybe you're in an organization or any other kind of, uh, of organization, we would love for you to uh, pick that up. So you can get that book now if you go to newdiversitybook.com. In fact, we'll put the link in the show notes for you to get to. That's newdiversitybook.com. Go ahead and pre-order that. Well, as always, if you would rate this podcast, give us five stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We would greatly appreciate that. If you thought this uh, podcast just made you think of somebody who you think would find it really helpful, we invite you to go ahead and just share it with them directly. We would appreciate that as well. Uh, if you want to connect with us online, we are at Growing Leaders and at Tim Elmore pretty much everywhere you are. And then finally, if you have ideas for this podcast, people you want us to interview, maybe a subject you think we should cover, shoot us an email. It's podcast at growingleaders.com. We love getting those from you. Tim, thank, thank you once again for sharing with us. Guys, go pre-order that book and we'll see you next time.